Just give me two seconds. Uh, all right. So uh, welcome to this uh, week's uh, episode of uh, the Zimbabwe Historical Association seminar series. And uh, today we have uh, two esteemed uh, presenters. We have uh, Wakai, God knows Wakai, and uh, Titus Rokuzo. And uh, today the two conversations will be talking about uh, livelihood and sustainability histories. So to kick us off, we will uh, start off with the presentation from uh, Titus, then uh, we give the platform to God knows, and then after that, uh, we can have maybe a quick brief uh, plenary session amongst us, and uh, that will be the order of the day today. So without wasting any time, uh, Titus, the floor is yours. <coughs> Okay, good afternoon to you all. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. So my name is Titus Chidemi. I'm a prospective PhD student and I'll be presenting my, PA, my MA thesis um, uh, from the University of Zimbabwe, which reads uh, live roads and food security in the mining setting, uh, the case of Uzumbamamba Fungu in Zimbabwe from 2005 to 2020. Um, so the research uh, deployed the case of Uzumbamba Fungwe, uh, UMP, a district uh, which is in Zimbabwe, Mashonal in this province, uh, to examine the role played by uh, formal and artisanal mining in rural livelihoods. Uh, the study situated the formal mining activities conducted in UMP within the broader framing of um, exploitative and rent-seeking practices, uh, considering the amount of resentment they have uh, generated among the locals. So ironically, the rapidly expanding artisanal mining activities, which are deemed uh, illegal in Zimbabwe, have turned out to be a more reliable source of livelihood. Um, climate change has compounded the food security outlook in uh, the district's rainfall patterns um, pattern has negatively altered the cropping situation. And as a district that falls within the agricultural region five, uh, which is character, with characteristics of uh, very low rainfall, water temperatures and poor soils, and uh, as well as um, combined impact of climate change, um, and other adverse factors against uh, active crop cultivation and good yield has been uh, unbearable. So the research conceptualized food security as a, as a problem that is exacerbated by severe and hyper arid ecological conditions of the region. Uh, the advent, the advent, the advent the advent of formal mining in this district has renewed hopes for alternative livelihoods. So if we are to look at the maybe the geographical location of uh, UMP, we find that it is uh, roughly about 2,660 kilometer, square kilometers in extent and is located in the northern part of Zimbabwe. And in terms of its political delimitations, uh, the region is divided into two constituencies, which are Uzumba and Marambafungwe constituencies, and has got 17 administrative wards. Um, uh, people mainly who uh, people mainly depend on uh, subsistence farming, primarily uh, inhabit uh, this district. So. Uh, if we dissect maybe the, 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 the constituencies, we note that in Uzimba, the economic activities uh, cover um, economic activities such as market gardening of vegetable, vegetables, crops, and uh, livestock farming. And in Marambafungwe, uh, the economic activities include uh, maize crop cultivation, cotton farming, and livelihood rearing. Uh, gold uh, and limestone mining, which was uh, initiated by Lafarge Cement Company uh, around the around in 2005. Um, 
So historically, despite the vagaries of climate and weak soils, uh, UMP uh, has depended on production of small grains, sorghum, millet primarily, and along other animal husband activities, which somewhat provided a safety net. So the study uh, aimed at uh, looking at the state of food security within the gold and limestone extractive industry in Zimbabwe uh, by lo looking at the experiences of UMP. And the objectives of the studies were to identify the root causes of food security within the, the district uh, in spite of the ongoing mining uh, operations in the areas, and also to examine the survival strategies that were adopted by host communities against the, the background of rapidly declining economic conditions uh, obtaining uh, in the district. Um, so maybe uh, I can uh, the study used um, qualitative and quantitative methodologies to bring out the relationship between communities and mining capital. And while, focuses, while fo focusing on the, the relationship between security and the extractive uh, industry, MP, or, uh, explored on the history of uh, food security in the from the 1980s to the new uh, So the term food security uh, is a highly contested term. And according to the definition by the Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, food security was defined as when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to adequate, safe, and nutritious food which met their needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. So food availability and access to food were the yardsticks that are used to determine food security at a household level in UMP. Uh, and from, from the colonial period, you find that um, from the colonial period to the early years of post-independent Zimbabwe, the inhabitants in um, UMP, they depended on small grains uh, such as sorghum, millet, and rapoko. Uh, although they supplemented with other economic activities to achieve uh, food security. Uh, so food, uh, small grains are made the greater part of the inhabitants' food production and food uh, pr problem during the colonial period was attributed to several factors such as um, the colonial repressive measures uh, that were in place during the time. So you find, that during, you find that during the colonial period, the government restricted the movement of small grains from one area to another as they were believed uh, to have been carriers of pests and diseases which affected meat production. And in the early 1980s, there was a shift from small traditional grains to maize crop, which subsequently saw the demise um, the demise of small grain. Uh, and however, with the law, uh, with the law and erratic rainfalls, the inhabitants were, were first by food shortage, uh, food shortages, uh, which were caused by low yields in crop production. So around the years 1882 to 83, um, the inhabitants shifted from crop production to artisanal gold mining. And Artisanal gold mining became an exceedingly um, essential coping strategy as a seasonal or part time livelihood mechanism. Uh, so, despite the, uh, the, the regions, the region, the fact, despite the fact that the regions are uh, uh, produced very little in terms of crop output, uh, crop production was placed as the major source of um, food security. And in recent years, farmers who depend on, agri on agriculture for food uh, production inhabit uh, the district. And it has been argued that uh, crop production uh, that is likely to last for more than six months is the major source of food for over 80% of rural households. Whereas in, U in, in UMP, crop production 
in an agricultural season can barely at the time is covered three months, uh, making the, dis the district susceptible to food um, insecurity. Um, so I also went on to look at uh, the role of, um, I looked at the role of limestone quarrying and that of gold, uh, gold mining and UMP. So the effects of um, the, the amount of factors um, that drove uh, the, the nexus between mining and food security. On the one hand, uh, mining has generated direct and indirect jobs and has provided better market access to farmers. Uh, the increase in household income has promoted uh, food security. And on the other hand, mining has uh, increased, the, uh, increased the vulnerability of rural uh, livelihoods by promoting large scale land disposition, which um, lowered agricultural productivity. And this was the case with uh, the acquiring operations of Lafayette Cement Company uh, found in, um, in UMP. So, Mining activity in the area had an impact on employment, uh, education services, and health care improvement. And there's been social and structural changes in the community, which uh, affect the inhabitants, food security, and livelihood. Um, and also the company's quarrying activities has led to the displacement of people who live uh, close to the quarry mine um, in the year. 2013. So from 2005, from the when the quarrying operation started, the company provided uh, employment opportunities to the community. However, the skilled manpower who took important positions at the quarry came from Marari, and the the, the locals were, were only uh, into menial jobs, and the lack of skilled employment opportunity opportunities were attributed to that. Uh, Lafarge needed specialized skills to operate complicated machines. Um, and by 2007 to 2009, um, there was a growth in establishment of uh, can canteens close to the mining site, which uh, created self-employment uh, for some of the inhabitants in the community. Um, Artisanal mining and, um, can be distinguished in two types. Uh, artisanal, artisanal, artisanal small scale mining can be distinguished in two types. Um, it can be distinguished as registered miners, miners with small claims and gold processing mills, which can be individually owned or company owned. And the other type is informal, unregistered or illegal uh, producers. Um, known as uh, Magwedja. So in the years that um, you know, U UMP was facing food shortages um, was the very same time, was the first time again that gold mining began to gain, gain momentum, to gain momentum. Um, so the start of gold mining planning led to the emergence of formal mining activities in UMP in the early 1990s. And before the boom in gold planning, there were existed gold claims uh, that were pegged by, by the Germans. Um, and the emergence of formal mining was a stepping stone to some inhabitants in the community who worked for the mining company as it provided uh, them with employment opportunities. Um, so, extractive industries um, affected food security in different ways. And on one hand, it enhanced uh, the access of food by generating income opportunities like employment. Uh, on the other hand, extractive industry affected food production, um, which in the end, uh, affected its availability and accessibility. So maybe in conclusion, I can say, uh, 
present an interesting case study for exploring the nexus between food security and the extractive industry. Uh, the study unearthed on how extractive industry can affect food security by analyzing the impact of mining on food production and ultimately on food um, security. The study also shown that uh, uh, the study is shown that food security is not only concerned with food production only, but also food access, food utilization, um, and food um, availability. So I think I'll end here. Thank you very much, uh, Rukuzo, for a very interesting uh, talk. Uh, without taking much time, we will quickly get into the next presenter, who also has uh, 15 minutes on the clock, and then we can open for uh, different uh, rounds of uh, questions after the presentation. So, Mr. Bodnos, the floor is up to you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, a good afternoon to you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, before I start my presentation, um, I would like to acknowledge the presence of my two supervisors from the Chinua University of Technology, Professor Maria Tsere and um, Professor Jacob Mapara. They are my supervisors. <clears throat> well, I am uh, Vakai Godnose, um, a PhD student with the Chinua University of Technology. I'm studying towards a DPhil in sustainable technologies and livelihoods. Um, today, <clears throat> I want to present one of my uh, PhD thesis. Uh, it is work in progress. Uh, so I will take note of um, uh, the comments that will arise from the floor. Uh, as you can see, when the flighted uh, PowerPoint uh, is titled Towards a Life Loose Framework for Transforming uh, Extractive Communities Through Sustainable Natural Heritage Exploitation in the Zimbabwean Dawendo Chromite Mining Community. Um, this research is uh, made uh, within the context of uh, rising poverty, world poverty. Um, as you um, get into the presentation, uh, I think it's important to take note of the fact that uh, poverty includes, but is not limited to food, uh, lack of food and income, lack of access to water and education, lack of infrastructure development, protection from climatic vagaries, voice, rights, and uh, so forth. And this research is made within the context uh, of rising world multi-dimensional uh, multi poverty. Um, there's been an extreme poverty uh, rate rise uh, as witnessed uh, from the 1990s, um, we can note that the multidimensional poverty rose from around 8.4% uh, uh, to around 9.5% in 2020 uh, is in accordance with the United Nations report of 2021. Um, we have seen a global poverty rate, a projection, uh, a rise of uh, about 7%. Uh, it's a projection to say that by 2030, about 600 million people are projected to be living uh, in abject poverty. Um, so of the world's 7.8 billion, about 1.3 billion are multidimensionally poor. And uh, as you can see from the figures projected there, most of them are women and children, as they constitute almost 85%. And 
looking at the sustainable sustainable development goal number one, which aimed at poverty eradication everywhere. We can see that this figure represents a failure eradicate poverty, hence a, this study. Within Sub-Saharan uh, Africa, it can be noted that 71.9% of people are multidimensionally poor. And from this figure, only 25.2% are in urban areas, and the rest are found within rural communities. Hence, the emphasis uh, for this study, which is within the rural setting. Um, the Global North and international financial institutions, uh, such as the World Bank groups, the IMF and the World Trade Organization, hence, um, in an effort to try and eradicate poverty, uh, prescribed some uh, programs aimed at eradicating poverty. Hence, for example, we have the big report which initiated uh, the structural adjustment program by World Bank to the Sub-Saharan Africa 1981. We have such programs like the Africa Priority Programs for Economic Recovery and Development of 1986 and 1990, the United Nations Program for Africa Economic uh, Recovery and Development of 1986 and 1990, uh, all down to the United Nations New Agenda for the Development uh, of Africa of 1990, and of course, the NEPAD of 2021. This list is not, um, uh, this is not the, the, the whole list. There are other programs which I did not put there, but all were efforts at trying to eradicate poverty within the global South. So given this, why then is it that we are so much interested in the aspect of poverty. It was noted that these top-down approaches failed to eradicate poverty at grassroots level. Warm, the government of Zimbabwe in the 1980s uh, then resorted to the pro-socialist policies. In the 1990s, adopted the neoliberal policies. Uh, in the 2000s, the first regland reform program and the Reserve Bank quasi fiscal activities, proliferation of <laughs> non formalized economic activities, all did not aid much um, in eradicating poverty within extractive communities. Hence, livelihoods continued to deteriorate. The government of Zimbabwe in the 2000s. Its focus was on agriculture, hence people resorted to off farm activities and the migration. And take note that this migration <coughs> is not, not internal migration, but rather external migration. The resultant effect, the resultant net effect was a continued rise in multidimensional poverty. Within the rural settings, there were rural poverty alleviation strategies, such as the establishment of cooperatives, growth points, the district development fund, uh, development programs. And of course, within the communities themselves, such programs like the campfire, uh, the community areas management program for indigenous resources, the community share ownership trust and resettlement programs. But these, did not meet, uh, meet the mark. They failed to eradicate multi-dimensional poverty, reasons being um, wrong policy prescription, unsuitable top-down approaches, the lack of inclusivity, and lack of adequate funding. Hence, this research is undertaken with a view to developing a model to eradicate multi-dimensional poverty within the extractive communities of Dawendale to transform the lives of people who live there. 
Um, the problem uh, existing is multi-dimensional poverty within the chromite uh, extractive community of Dawende. This is despite the fact that we have mining taking place there. Of course, there's formal and informal mining uh, that is taking place there. But the level of multi-dimensional poverty is so high and it, this translates into the low life loads. Uh, the affected population is the Dawendale chromite uh, extractive community. If not solved, the problem may crystallize into a, uh, into a cro chronic problem leading to a vicious cycle of poverty, economic insecurity, and the ultimately threaten national security. Um, if not solved, it means there will be the failure of attaining the world sustain, sustain SDG goals, a failure to attain the Africa Vision 2063, failure to attend the Second Republic Government of Zimbabwe Vision 2030. The Government of Zimbabwe made some poverty alleviation strategic efforts, which include the 1980s um, land redistribution, 99, uh, the 2000 land redistribution programs, the establishment of cooperatives, growth points, infrastructural development through the DDF, as well as the community share ownership trust programs. At community level, there were indeed programs such as the community areas management program for indigenous resources, but all this failed to eradicate poverty among raw Zimbabwean extractive communities. Hence, the aim of this study is to develop a livelihood framework for transforming chromite extractive communities through sustainable natural heritage exploitation in the Zimbabwean Dawendo chromite mining community. Um, to do that, there are a number of objectives that um, I penned down. Uh, chief being, the study seeks to develop a sustainable extractive framework to be employed by small to medium enterprise chromite extractive communities in Dawendale to improve livelihoods, to establish the extent to which locals are included in chromite mining in Dawendale, to examine how the inclusion of locals is contributed to the improvement of the livelihoods of the Dawendale chromite uh, extractive community, to analyze the different types of socioeconomic relations uh, existing within the Dawendale chromite extractive community to analyze the chromite supply chain system in Dawendale and finally to develop a nationally recognized sustainable natural heritage ex extraction framework for Zimbabwe. And to assist me in that is a set of research questions that I penned it down. Sorry, sorry, Wakai. You have just under three minutes to go. Okay. okay. Uh, I shall not uh, give out the, the research questions. Um, the significance of the study is both at national, at uh, local, and uh, as well as to uh, set a base for public uh, strategic development, as well as to uh, assist the reach out by government. The study area is Dawendale, uh, an area uh, covering approximately 100 square kilometers. Um, the study is guided by basically by three theories, the theory of modernization, the dependence theory, and the false paradigm model. Um, and to assist me in research, the study adopts the pragmatism research philosophy. It is a quali quant research. It, it assumes a quali quant research approach and assumes an exploratory case study research design um, uh, with the requisite research methods 
methodological uh, uh, systems. I think basically uh, with that, I will quickly uh, conclude uh, my, yeah, my, my presentation so that I don't go beyond the required time. So basically that's much about my research. Thank you. All right, thank you very much uh, for the two presentations. Thank you, uh, Wakai, uh, God knows, and uh, Titus Rukuzo for your interesting talks. Now we shall open the floor to uh, questions. You from the audience, uh, feel free to either use uh, the icons on your screen at the bottom, or alternatively, you can also just type in your question in the chat box. So if there are any questions or any comments to our panel, uh, please feel free to go ahead. But as uh, we wait for those different questions to come in, uh, can I abuse my position as the chair and just pose a question, uh, starting with Titus. Uh, Titus, where do you locate the role of uh, politics within your case study, within your conversation of a UMP? and uh, it's a rich political history in Zimbabwe, where we know that uh, it is a stronghold for uh, the ruling party and the politics of using food and grain to win political votes. Where would you locate that within the discourse of uh, food security? Is it also, does the politics that uh, a lot of uh, political leaders come from that, influential political leaders come from that area, contribute to, the to, to, to their attitude towards agriculture and sorry, 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 their attitude towards agriculture and uh, looking for viable solutions because they know that uh, when uh, they are hungry, their political leaders and the local leadership is going to go to the top elections of government and bring food aid for them. And uh, I see Tinashe has got his hand up. Tinashe, you can go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, first, first of all, congratulations to, 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 to both presenters for the work that they've presented. Um, but sort of mumbling because I'm looking for the titles. Okay, I've got them now. My question to both, I think to Titus, I have one, and then uh, to God knows I have, uh, I think two. So the first one is probably to both of them. Right, um, <clears throat> Titus, you're looking at food livelihoods and food security in a mining setting. So I'm wondering why the mining setting part is necessary. Because from the presentation, I got the impression that your topic is really focusing particularly on the question of livelihoods and food securities in a more open-ended manner. And you know, mining comes in as part of that, rather than the focus necessarily being on mining. So um, I'd like a clarification on that. And um, I suppose the same question is important for God knows as well, because uh, you are setting your research around the question of chromite, chromite mining or the chromite mining community. But really all of the questions you raise, the objectives and what have you are really targeted towards um, livelihood frameworks for those particular communities. Does it matter whether they have to be extractive or mining communities, or you can still locate this research elsewhere where you actually don't have any mining communities? That's the first question. And the second question to God knows, um, you said, would you mind going back to that slide where you were talking about modernization approach? I'm curious to hear exactly what you wanted to say there before I can raise my question. Okay. <clears throat> or maybe you can just re you know, remind me, did you say you're going to use mod a modernization framework? Um. I said the, the research will be informed basically by three theories. Uh -huh. Theory, three, the modernization theory, the dependence theory, and the um, 
the post paradigm theory. Okay. <clears throat> Those sound very broad to me, right? If you're going to talk about modernization, dependency, false paradigm, they sound extremely broad. Um, for a question that, I mean, for an approach that is focused on a particular community in a very specific setting in Darwindale. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know how you're going to employ them. Uh, couldn't you find, um, I, I think, a more um, relevant theory, something that deals with smaller communities, perhaps a matter of sense, um, what, what, what is that? Uh, Flam mind used small is beautiful, for instance. Um, a matter of sense capabilities approach, which looks at the capabilities of specific communities and how they can utilize the resources within the areas that they are. And a matter of sense approach, just as Flam mind is, is very critical of these bigger, broader theories. And I'm sure, as you've seen in the literature, a lot of these 1960s, 1970s approaches have since been challenged. So I'm wondering whether you could consider looking at those, but I suppose that those are the two questions I can raise at this point. Thanks, Brian. All right, thank you. Uh, we shall give the, the, um, the presenters the platform to, to respond, or at least we conjure up more questions from uh, the audience. <clears throat> okay. Okay. You can Are start through. All right. So maybe to answer maybe the first question uh, by by Brian. Um, we we but you were asking that where do, where where do I place uh, politics and in this study? So maybe from from the research. Um, that there were um, there have been um, questions that, that that have been raised by 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 some of the locals, and mainly uh, it was on food distribution, on seed and crop uh, distribution, uh, whereby some political persons um, were hijacking. Um, the some of the food uh, food aid or food programs that were coming in uh, with some uh, non-governmental organization and as well as some um, uh, governmental uh, food programs. So you find that some of the politi uh, political persons were were hijacking uh, these um, food uh, distribution programs and to gain. Um, Political to to to, uh, to gain political support from 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 the locals, and maybe to answer the second question on whether the, on why why mining setting is necessary, um, I think it is necessary in that um, extractive industry affect our food security, and as I I I I wanted to explore the nexus, uh, the relationship that is there between food security and uh, extractive mining, considering that uh, uh, mining is one of its uh, main economic activities. Uh, maybe that's why, so maybe that's, that, that's why I can say I, I had to include uh, the, the extractive industry uh, in the research. Thank you. Okay. Uh, to, to respond to Prof. Nyamunda's concerns, uh, the, the second one, um, yes, I acknowledge uh, the fact that uh, those three theories that I, I alluded to, uh, they are now a bit um, uh, old, per se although they contain the, 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 the basis, much of uh, the current research is based on, 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 on those theories. Of course, uh, I will consider uh, the, the suggested uh, 
theories. Uh, however, I may not entirely run away from, from them. I, I, I do acknowledge. Then um, the first one, I, I situated the chromite mining setting uh, basically for two reasons. The first being that the mining sector currently is the lead sector of Zimbabwe. If you look at uh, the Second Republic's main focus, the main thrust is on mining. They talk of inclusivity, they talk of, uh, you know, all, all the good talk. And it seems the talk is directed at mining. Where you see the central government's focus being on mining, uh, it drove me to then want and investigate wh what is the life like within the extractive communities. Um, secondly, the aspect of uh, maybe still on that, take note that the mining sector is at 2020 so far. It has contributed more than $2 billion to the Zimbabwean uh, uh, fiscus. And as at 20, 20, 2021, it contributed about 60% of Zimbabwe's gross domestic product. Hence, with that, naturally, uh, you would want to look at that. Then, secondly, when you look at the, the mineral chromite, um, the feministers have written much on gold and other people have written in the various areas. But the aspect of chromite in Zimbabwe, there's, yes, of course, there's much research, but I feel that there's still room for research within. It's my, my interest. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I see there's another hand uh, from uh, Tinashe and uh, Teverai. I also saw that uh, your hand came up for a while. Uh, perhaps Tinashe can go ahead. All right, um, again, two questions. I'll, I'll give a very contemporary, you know, a very recent example about the way in which mining has been wrongly leveraged for economic development. Um, and we can give numerous examples. I'll start with Chrome. I don't know if you are aware of the work recently done by one Joseph Njere. God knows. Um, he, I, I once talked to him, but I, I didn't have access to, to, to his work. All right, if, if you could... Um, Perhaps talk to him or, or, or look up his work. He's, he's done work on chrome mining in Zimbabwe, uh, yes. particularly artisanal chrome mining, where he's talking yes. about the way it is produced and marketed and the, problem, the problems arising from that and the way in which the state has wrongly intervened. You can get the example of platinum in which platinum is being exported raw out of the country. And as you and I know, platinum has over 18 different minerals in it. So if you're going to export it raw and you don't process it, that means you're making a significant loss. And very recently, um, I'm forgetting which mineral it is that has recently been leveraged. That was leveraged by the Zimbabwean government in 2006. Right, the Zimbabwean government received about what was it, two hundred million uh, dollars, and they leveraged over twenty six thousand ounces, uh, which is worth over fifty two billion. Right now, I'm raising these points, and you, another point is in diamond mining, for instance. I mean, in diamond mining, for instance, I'm sure you know this whole story around. Uh, the disappearing 15 billion, but there's quite a lot of work in that area as well. Now, yes. I'm raising these points, especially looking at how you are sort of putting not just the Second Republic, I, 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 I don't know what's so Second Republic about it, but the way in which you're looking at the Zimbabwean government as being at the forefront of development from the 1980s onwards. If anything, 
it has been at the forefront of economic collapse rather than the forefront of development itself. And if we're going to check the example of mining, no way is it clearer than in that particular sector. You look at the work of people such as, um, um, what's his name, Richard Saunders, where he's looking at um, the regulation of mining in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. I can share that work with you. And it will demonstrate the extent to which the state has actually been anti-developmental. On top of that, besides the fact that it's highly informalized, there are cartels that are controlling the mining sector. And these cartels are actually exporting, you know, without necessarily providing receipts for the Zimbabwe Revenue Authorities or any of such places. Are you going to consider all of those things? Because the way in which you're... Um, forefronting the state, making it appear as if it is at the forefront of trying to uh, alleviate poverty is highly problematic. <clears throat> yeah. Um, as regards the issue for forefronting uh, the, 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 the state, actually, my first paper from this war thesis, I tried to investigate uh, such issues whereby we, we, we talk about the, the dual system uh, existing where we have the modern uh, governance uh, system as well as the traditional systems and see, try and understand the, the, the relationships, the, the influence the, and, and all stuff. So, in fact, I, I don't actually say that the government um, wins all the credit for, for bringing development or for intending to bring development. But rather, I try and investigate the government's part in developing or in preventing development. But uh, I acknowledge what you are saying. Uh, I will be in contact. Um, as uh, for Dr. Mjeri's paper, yes, I talked to him uh, the previous time. Uh, we actually wanted to, 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 to work together on this because his focus mainly was for Midlands going down, but my focus was on the Northern block of Zimbabwe in terms of chromite uh, mining. But uh, however, I will talk to him. But I, I, I do accept uh, uh, your comments, uh, Prof. Will there be any other questions uh, coming from the floor? Okay, uh, Tevarai's question from the chat box says, uh, he just want to hear from Akai how food security is linked to mining activities in your area of study. And uh, is uh, food security a burden in uh, mining rich centers? Perhaps it's a question that can also go to the both of you since uh, you do speak about livelihoods within these mining centers. Given that, uh, as Tevarai was is posing that these are mining rich areas, is, the, is there a big burden on food security within these spaces from your research? Uh, I can see Titus is muted. Yes, um, in my <clears throat> uh, research, I try to understand the relationship between the various groups. You see, I, I talked about a community. This community is not uh, living independently of other communities. When you look at Dawendo, Dawendo is unique in, in its setting. There's the farming community around, uh, there's the military com community around, uh, there's a dam, tourism and fishing, you see. And all those subsectors have a, a link, direct or indirect, with the chromite uh, mining community. And I try to understand the relationships between those various subsectors, how they impact 
with each other. Obviously, uh, or maybe I shouldn't say that. I, I want to understand what is the effect of such mining on other sub uh, economic activities. Okay, and uh, Titus, would you like to respond as well? Mm, I didn't quite get the question. Uh, Tevere was asking that if uh, the concern of food security is uh, a burden to to mining direct to mining rich areas, if uh, the issues of food security actually impacts if it's a burden in these mining rich areas, given that comparatively they enjoy better wealth, uh, economic fortunes as compared to other areas, which perhaps survive on agrarian means, when Therefore, if it if there's low rainfall patterns, for instance, they can't they don't have any alternative. Whereas, capacity to whereas these mining spaces have got uh, the advantage of also turning to 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 mining to for their fortunes. So he was asking if it's a burden within these areas. Well, I think we can say it is a burden in that. Uh, you find that, uh, for example, in UMP, there um, they are some mining companies, some Chinese mining companies uh, who are coming to, to mine in the communities. Um, and you find that some of these mining com communities, they are actually um, affecting um, the inhabitants food security. They, I think it was last year or last year there was um, this mining company whereby they went and uh, they started to do their mining um, activity uh, in a community whereby uh, they destroyed uh, the crops uh, of the inhabitants and it caused uh, tension between the, the, the company and uh, the locals. So you find that uh, is a burden considering the fact that uh, these um, some of these mining companies they are coming and they are destroying um, the livelihood of the the, 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 the inhabitants who, who who live in um in this community and also you find that the my, more, most of these mining companies they are doing their their their, their, their mining operations are, are along the Mazowe River, and these activities they are being destructive and they are causing um, uh, some water shortages uh, for the inhabitants. And according to the, the, the to, to to the to the locals themselves, um, they argue that uh, no meaningful uh, development uh, is coming uh, with these uh, uh, mining mining companies. So you find that there is also that whereby the Chinese uh, companies, they are also affecting uh, the livelihood of the inhabitants with their operations. All right, thank you very much. Uh, would like to, I don't see any hands uh, from the panel anymore. I uh, would like to thank the the presenters and Brian. Uh, Brian. Yeah. Brian. Oh, yes, Tim. So, sorry, I was trying to, to raise my hand and I was fiddling with the computer there. Um, can, can I ask a very, very. Yes, um, you can go one. ahead, Aldrin. Um, um, uh, so. Uh, this is directed at um, at uh, at, is it at Titus, right? I hope I got that right. Um, so Titus, you're talking about. Um, I, I also heard uh, the same word being used by uh, God. God knows um, development. Um, so when you are talking about development, do the locals articulate what they mean by 
absence or presence of development, what does development look like to the locals? And how is this development, uh, what you're calling development, different from how the state or how capital sees development and how locals see development? Thank you, uh, Brian. <laughs> All right, thank you, Alton, for that. Uh, I don't know if Titus and um, and God knows would like to to also respond to that and also just give uh, closing remarks as we wrap up uh, today's uh, seminar. Okay, maybe to to respond to that, uh, the development um, from the from the locals uh, is maybe in form of social social and economic development. Um, you find that with, um, uh, with Lafarge uh, Cement Company in, um, in UMP, there's been um, some services it has been providing to the community whereby they were paying school fees for the locals and they were also providing, um, they were providing, um, they were providing uh, some some there were the some health care in, in fact there was some health care improvement uh, which came as a result from the Lafarge company and also there is this um, there is this vocational training center uh, Nakiwa uh, Nakiwa training center which was built by by, by, by Lafarge uh, Cement Company. So to them, maybe to the locals, this is the, uh, the, 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 the development uh, in which they'll be looking for uh, that, 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 that will come out of mining. And also you find that um, mm, uh, there is also a transitive role that is being played by the mining that is uh, taking place in um in um uh, in these areas whereby uh there's been a there's been a, a boost maybe in the in the local in local businesses uh which are adjacent to the mining operations of some of these mining companies so maybe to them to the locals we are looking at social economic and maybe social capital development um uh on the on the locals thank you yes um i i acknowledge that um development there is a problematic word but my only understanding is that uh, this development is relative how development is defined by the locals may be different from how it is defined by the state. Remember, we said, when we were defining poverty, we said it's lack of access to what? Education, the lack of infrastructural uh, development, lack of, uh, lack of access to medicine and stuff. When the Dawendo community talks of development within the Dawendo community, they look forward to the building of, say, a road. The road that links down the shops in the Maryland is a dirty road. When that road is tarmacadamized, if that translates to development for the local community, there are seven primary schools within the Dawendio area. Albeit, they are seven to 10 kilometers apart. But when the mining community say establishes a school that cuts the distance to the community that may translate into development. When they have access to cheap food, that translates to development. And that is different from maybe the government. The government's focus may be to establish schools. It, it doesn't mind how many, it just says, we have managed to establish schools in Darwendale. And 
that will not assist in any way to, to the people. But uh, I, I'm interested in, uh, when I go down there for field work, I will take note of that and, and try to find out what do, how do they define a development per se? I mean, the locals. Thank you. All right, uh, and thank you very much uh, to you both for your time and for the still in presentations. Uh, thank you to everybody also who came through. We like to wish uh, the presenters all the best in their studies and uh, in their research. And uh, thank you very much for the continued support in the JAR seminar series. We will keep in touch. Uh, this particular episode will be flighted on the various social media platforms and uh, the link will be shared with you all. Uh, do stay safe and uh, continue to be blessed. Thank you very much, everybody. All right.